to develop the thoughts uh, in this presentation. So uh, I'd love to uh, uh, share with you the details of Grand Canyon in uh, southwestern United States and a lot of my experience with Grand Canyon. You know, I've spent over two years of my life, or I think about two years of my life, below the rim of Grand Canyon, uh, living in the, on the, along the river, uh, doing raft trips, uh, dropped off by helicopters, um, hiking through Grand Canyon. And uh, as a geologist, it's a, it's a marvelous place. Grand Canyon is a marvelous place. I've been uh, uh, visiting it for 50 years. Uh, love Grand Canyon. Uh, spent uh, almost two years of my life below the rim of Grand Canyon. Done 30 raft trips through Grand Canyon. Uh, written science papers on Grand Canyon. Did uh, uh, all kinds of, I wrote a book on Grand Canyon. So uh, just enjoy Grand Canyon. And uh, it's a wonderful place, and uh, just love going there. As you go there on the rim of Grand Canyon, the south rim of Grand Canyon is about 2,100 meters elevation. It's, uh, and you're looking down there, the canyon's... Uh, over a kilometer deep, kilometer and a half deep, and it is uh, immense. And uh, always when I'm at the rim of Grand Canyon with an assembly of people, I always hear people speaking German. And so Germany obviously visits Grand Canyon an uh, enormous uh, amount of the time. And uh, it's an international uh, attraction. And we enjoy sharing the Grand Canyon with uh, many of our friends here in Germany. There's something amazing about Grand Canyon. You see the river along the uh, bottom of Grand Canyon, an elevation about 700 meters above sea level. That's the Colorado River. The river's in this enormous canyon. Canyon is about uh, 500 kilometers long, counting the upstream areas all the way through northern Arizona. And uh, at the rim, south rim's about 2,500 feet elevation, 2,500 meters elevation. It's uh, um, got a ponderosa pine forest. North Rim of Grand Canyon, way over there on the other side, is about 25 kilometers away, the widest part of the canyon. And uh, it's uh, 2,500 meters above sea level on the North Rim, South Rim, 2,100 meters above sea level. And there's the, there's the river down there, uh, almost 2,000, almost two kilometers uh, below the rim. As you look at Grand Canyon, you get the impression you've got the inside story to the ground beneath our feet. Look at what you see. You see layers of rock, sandstone, shale, and limestone primarily. See the flat layers throughout the Grand Canyon exposed by the, the canyon erosion. As you look at those layers, they're very continuous across both sides of Grand Canyon. And you look down the bottom of Grand Canyon, you see crystalline rocks, like rocks like granite and um, gneiss and schist, basalt. You see all kinds of interesting rocks in the inner gorge of Grand Canyon. And then above, you see this um, amazing display of strata. Grand Canyon is amazing. And uh, let's go look at it and let's talk about it.
let's put the pieces together. I got five pieces you put together and you get a picture of Grand Canyon. Put the pieces together and think about uh, what you're seeing. Grand Canyon creation and the global flood. When you uh, go to Grand Canyon or think about Grand Canyon, it's a cultural icon. It's an icon for, has become an icon for what? Deep time, thinking about millions of years typically, billions of years people often uh, associate with it. Primitive earth, there's some type of image of a primitive earth that we see, especially by looking at the bottom of Grand Canyon, we think of calm and placid seas, the ocean making the rock strata layers of Grand Canyon, but over a, an immense period of time. The idea of the calm and placid seas, I'll get to that and talk about that a little bit. And then the idea of slow erosion. That's what Grand Canyon is famous for. And that's what I want to challenge as a geologist that image of Grand Canyon. I want to present a different view of Grand Canyon. I want to talk to you about Grand Canyon creation of the global flood. And so what you see that's been interpreted in that icon way of deep time, primitive earth, calm and placid seas, and slow and gradual erosion, I want to reinterpret. Who has not been told the story that Grand Canyon was eroded by the Colorado River during millions of years. Those of us in the United States, as we grew up in grammar school, we were presented the idea that uh, the Colorado River cut Grand Canyon over millions of years. Believe it or not, it's rather controversial among geologists if you bring up the idea the Colorado River cut Grand Canyon. There's lots of geologists who... Uh, want to talk about other things than that. And, uh, but it has become, a, come, become the icon for slow and gradual evolution. Here's my block diagram of Grand Canyon showing the, the different strata layers in the, and rock uh, layers in Grand Canyon. The bottom layers of the Grand Canyon are crystalline rock. You can see right here, Zoaster and Vishnu. Zoaster and Vishnu. On top of that sits about 13,000 feet um, of a, almost uh, th three kilometers thickness of tilted strata. And that, those tilted strata are limestone, shale, and sandstone, a little bit of basalt. And that rock uh, layer is tilted there somehow related to uh, the uh, inner structure of the Grand Canyon. Then you see on top of that, this beveled surface called the Great Unconformity, the Great Unconformity, and then you see the uh, a kilometer and a half uh, thickness of, uh, from Tapete Sandstone up to the Kaibab Limestone on the rim of Grand Canyon the flat strata of the Grand Canyon. Those are the persistent strata that they're exposed um, prominently throughout the Grand Canyon. Occasionally, you see the inner gorge of Grand Canyon. You'll see some of these other rocks, the, the deep rocks that form the, the bottom of the, uh, of the Grand Canyon. Is it deep time? Is it the primitive earth? Is it the placid sea? And is it slow and gradual erosion? Um, I had access to a quarter million dollars. How many euros is that? It's about the same amount, a quarter million euros? Yeah. 200,000 Euro, uh, 200, uh, euros. Okay, and what I did was I used radioisotope dating to date the rocks of Grand Canyon, the rock layers of Grand Canyon. I dated the diabase sill at Bass Rapids. Right there is molten uh, rock 
molten material that was injected in between strata layers in the Hakatai Shale. It's called the Bass Rapids Diabase Sill. If anything in the Grand Canyon could be successfully dated, it would be a molten rock mass squeezed in between layers abruptly that cooled rapidly. And uh, it, it's arguably the, the, the one uh, uh, rock body in Grand Canyon that would be most readily dated by the radioisotope dating techniques. So I had a 200,000 euros uh, a budget and I did radioisotope dating on the Bass Rapids diabase sill. I dated it by the potassium argon isochron method and uh, the isochron method is the most elaborate of the dating techniques. It's more than um, a model age. It's, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated uh, graphical plot of the isotopes and the potassium argon isotope plot called the isochron plot gave an age of 0 0.84 billion years or 840 million year age. And uh, boy, that's deeply buried and down there uh, almost a billion years. Okay, I uh, dated it also by the potassium, not only just the potassium argon, but the rubidium strontium isochron method. The uh, uh, rubidium is a radioactive isotope that decays to strontium. Rubidium 87 decays to strontium 87, so I dated it by that technique. And it came 0.2. 1.06 billion years. Uh, very elaborate uh, isochron plot seemed to date it to three significant figures it, uh, uh, by the error bars. Also dated it by the lead-lead isochron method, 1.2 billion years, lead-lead, um, using uranium and thorium and lead, uh, ratios, you can, uh, you can do a lead-lead isochron, and that plot gave 1.2 billion years, and then I dated it by the Samaria neodymium isochron method at, at 1.4 billion years. The diabase sill at Bass Rapids, dated by the four long earth radioisotope methods, gave what? four different ages. They should have been one age for the diabase sill. The, the diabase uh, dates should all agree on one number for the age. Instead, we had four different numbers for the radioisotope age. What does that tell me? It tells me something. You know, it, what ha would have happened if I spent this uh, 200,000 euros uh, and got four, four concordant dates on the diabase sill of Grand Canyon, I would have had to report them. Instead, I reported four different dates for the, for the, the diabase sill at uh, Bass Rapids and Di in, in Grand Canyon. The, something might be wrong with the radioisotope dating assumptions. You know, radioisotope dating is like an hourglass. You have the, the grains falling from the hourglass from the top chamber to the bottom chamber. And if you assume it's a closed system, nothing is messed with the ratios of the, uh, of the grains. And you know what the beginning quantities are, are in the top and bottom chambers of the hourglass. And you have a constant rate of fall of particles or rate of decay in radioisotope dating, that should give the age, correct age. We should get one age, four different methods. We got four different ages by four different methods. Something's wrong, I believe, with the assumptions of the radioisotope dating technique. Personally, I believe there's something wrong with the assumption of constant radioisotope decay. The alpha emitters, the uranium, 
thorium, lead, samarium, neodymium, those alpha emitters give older ages significantly older than the beta emitters, the uh, rubidium, strontium, and the potassium argon. And uh, so I think there's something wrong with the assumptions. And I think the constant decay assumption is the primary uh, problem with radioisotope methods. We made some incorrect assumptions about radioisotopes. And instead of billions of years now, geologists should be talking about what's wrong with the radioisotope dating methods. Uh, radioisotope dates show up in the geologic literature with a lot of hurrah and f wow. We, got, we dated the rock to three significant figures, everything. But radioisotope dates uh, die uh, very quietly, and, and people uh, just dismiss them. What is the true age of the diabase sill at Grand uh, uh, there at Bass Rapids in Grand Canyon? Uh, 0 0.84 billion years, the uh, potassium argon isochron. How about 1.06 billion years, the rubidium strontium isochron? How about 1.2 billion years, the uh, lead lead isochron age? Or uh, how about D, uh, 1.4 billion years? Or how about E? What, would, what could E be? Multiple choice test or quiz. <laughs> How about none of the above? Okay. <laughs> uh, I become a skeptic of radioisotope dating of rocks. None of the above. That, I think that's the correct answer. Okay. Something's wrong with the radioisotope methods and we need to get back to uh, uh, reality here after spending all that time on, uh, on radioisotope dating. What is the true age of the diabase sill at Grand Canyon? How about none of the above? I, that appears to me to be the correct answer. <laughs> uh, if anybody should believe that Grand Canyon rocks are a billion years old, it should be who? It should be me. Okay, I've spent more money than anybody else on dating Grand Canyon rocks, as far as I know. And, uh, and, and yet, here I am talking to you about it. The radioisotopes don't present a consistent picture of age. None of the above. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's talk about some of the pieces of, uh, of Grand Canyon. Uh, and let's bring them together. And I have a kind of a, a tacky way of talking about it. It's easy to memorize. It's my name, okay? <laughs> Let's bring five pieces together and talk about how to understand and interpret Grand Canyon. How do you like that? The uh, five pieces are S-T-E-V-E, -E, okay? It's and Steve is talking to you about uh, the pieces of Grand Canyon, so that'll help you remember it. And in that order, okay, S stands for sedimentation. When you look at Grand Canyon, you see the evidence of the ancient process of sedimentation that's formed of the rock strata layers and piled them up one on top of another the process of sedimentation, making the strata. Then you see the, the next process, the process of tectonics, which has taken the rock layers and, in this case, uplifted them way above the ocean level, here at 2,500 meters above sea level, and the rock layers have been bent and I'll show you places where the rocks, rocks are severely bent. And the tectonics of the process uh, has buckled the layers and tilted the layers and faulted and broken the layers enough so you can see the process of tectonics follows sedimentation. 
Do you see the, the sequence I'm going through? I'm showing you sedimentation. Then I'm talking to you about tectonics. And then what? Erosion. The first E stands for erosion. <laughs> and the canyon's eroded. And the erosion of the plateau and the erosion of the canyon. I'll talk about the two different types of erosion, the plateau erosion, the beveled surface over the top of the Colorado Plateau, and then I'll talk about the erosion of the canyon. And then the V, that V stands for volcanoes or volcanism. And uh, yeah, I like talking about volcanoes, don't I? Okay, you know, uh, you, you know, geologists like talking about volcanoes. And then the last E is exponential decline, exponential decline. In the, over the history of the Colorado Plateau and the Grand Canyon area, the processes seem to have shut down or greatly reduced, and so it seemed to be an exponential decline. And I'll talk about that, and I'll rate, relate that to the ideas of creation in the global flood. Rock strata layers are especially abundant in Grand Canyon, and uh, this layer, uh, the Coconino sandstone, about 100 meters thick, right here. Uh, you see the sand layers, horizontal, but inside the horizontal layers are those diagonal layers. That's called cross bedding. And cross bedding is the prominent property that you see in Grand Canyon sandstones. Underneath, you can see shale layers, the uh, uh, hermit formation underneath, a shaley, uh, and that's a fine-grained mud, not made out of coarser sand, but finer mud particles. And they're, they're in strata, flat strata, typically. And then up above there, I can see limestone strata, the uh, Toro Leap limestone above the Coconino Formation in Grand Canyon. And uh, that's the typical view that you see uh, uh, through the Grand Canyon is, is sandstone, shale, limestone stacked up on top of one another. Mount St. Helens helps me understand how strata form, okay? And so I... Uh, don't think about calm and placid seas forming strata. I think about catastrophic uh, events forming strata. And so Mount St. Helens, as I explained yesterday in my Mount St. Helens lecture, uh, that provides evidence of, of wow, of uh, rapid strata formation. Those pyroclastic flows that came out of the volcano, especially in the afternoon of May 18th, 1980, those pyroclastic flows came out of the volcano, and you remember my images showing the uh, pyroclastic flow deposits. Those are, uh, those are kind of like uh, granular slurries in gas that flowed out of the volcano over the landscape. And you can see they freeze abruptly and they form these deposits. And then you look at those deposits in cross-section, and you see all of this stratification. And uh, believe it or not, uh, this is the uh, pyroclastic flow deposit of June 12, 1980, between 9 p.m. and midnight uh, uh, on June 12, 1980. The imagery at uh, radar imagery from Portland, Oregon, showed an enormous mass of uh, fragmental debris over the volcano, and they came back and look at this, 25 feet, eight meters in thickness. Uh, this wonderfully layered deposit formed of all things in a hurricane, okay? And as you think about how particles flow over a surface, you might suppose that they would be mixed together, coarse and fine mixed, Instead, they separated out into uh, fine and coarse. And that's the, uh, that's the observation that needs to be explained. And uh, so catastrophic process can make layers rapidly. Even thin lamination can form in a hurricane. Uh, 
Now, um, we had thought that layers form slowly, like along the, the bank of a river, like between wet years and dry years. And, and uh, on the ocean floor, sediment accumulates slowly, like between, uh, in between hurricanes or uh, in n normal uh, quiet periods. And so, well, anyway, the, the observation is there that granular particulate rock uh, uh, can be redeposited in uh, these uh, very thin layers. It's a wonderful thing. Now, as we look at, like, the Tapeat sandstone in the bottom of Grand Canyon, there's over 100 meters thickness of sandstone in that one formation, and we can see the layering in, inside there, and then we see... Uh, even diagonal layers and cross bedding and other types of features. The same features in the pyroclastic flows at Mount St. Helens, many of the same features are seen here in the Grand Canyon. We have evidence of fossils in the sandstone strata, in the limestone strata, and the shale strata at Grand Canyon to indicate the ocean was over this area and it was water that was depositing there. And different than uh, uh, the gas charged slurries that are moving particles rapidly at Mount St. Helens, but the same process, uh, a similar process. This is a, uh, is a movie to indicate how the sandstone strata in the Coconino sandstone form. Now the the, the sand is being drug across the ocean floor by a fast-moving current, maybe at a, two meters per second, a fast-moving current, and it's sculpted into dunes, and then the dunes get buried, and it makes this uh, a feature called cross-bedded sandstone. So when we look at sandstones of the Grand Canyon, we see evidence of water current fast-moving water currents that make the, the layers. It had been interpreted as formed by deserts and desert dunes. It, the the uh, diagonal layering and the cross bedding is better interpreted to be water deposited. And so uh, there you see some of the, uh, the layers. That's Jurassic Na Navajo sandstone on the north, uh, a little bit north of Grand Canyon. And then we have the mud rocks. Okay, sandstones form rapidly by uh, sand being drug across the ocean floor by currents at two meters per second. And uh, th so these great dune-like uh, features can form and um, be deposited rapidly. How about the mud rocks? And the mud rocks, the shale layers, the, uh, which are silt and clay the, uh, particles, that's been interpreted to form slowly over long periods of time. This top illustration shows the idea that geologists have had that's dominated thinking for over 200 years. The idea is that the, the fine particles are dispersed in water and the fine particles sink very slowly the silt and clay particles set, settle slowly and they fall vertically onto the, uh, the su surface of sedimentation and that creates the layering. An average clay particle, maybe 10 microns in diameter, falls at maybe... Um, three feet per day, a meter per day. That's the slow velocity of fall of particles. And so if you imagine mud particles falling, they fall very slowly, don't they? And so that has led geologists over the last 200 years to suppose that the fine-grained mud deposits are formed by this slow and gradual rain of particles in other words, the calm and placid sea idea. And that's been the, uh, uh, been the dominant way of thinking about the process of sedimentation. 
in geology. And you can see it stated everywhere. Geologists uh, have assumed it. Uh, fine particles se settle slowly. Therefore, fine mud rocks form very slowly. And uh, the alternate idea has been proposed just recently by uh, geologists who have been studying mud deposited in, in flumes, in, in flume mud deposits. A, f a flume is a straight or a circular basin in which you can put mud and you can circulate it and you can make mud strata rapidly by um, mud particles flocculating together, forming clumps or clasts, and the particles settle fast and at an, a steep angle, 15 degrees relative to horizontal. You see, see what's typically there? And it creates this uh, ripple cross-lamination, what's been called ripple cross-lamination, and you can see what the, uh, uh, the, the layers look like. They look different than the layers formed very slowly by the continuous rain of particles. Here's a racetrack flume. That's a device that uh, the, the geologists and engineers use to make uh, mud uh, and sand uh, particles move. And this uh, elliptical flume is, uh, is made with a drive belt and with paddles. And it's driven by paddles, which get the water moving in a laminar flow and it creates this uh, fast-moving uh, racetrack of particles. And in the observation window, over uh, in the uh, other section here, you can watch the strata form, the stratification forming from the process of flocculated sedimentation. The, the particles flocculate together because of electrical attraction, the clay particles uh, are clumped and they fall rapidly like sand grains rapidly and they form the ripple cross lamination. That's what you can see here, the cross laminations formed. And uh, this uh, strata made rapidly in the racetrack flume has led geologists to uh, a completely different understanding of, of mud rocks. And we call it, and they call it, the, the, the new geologists are doing these investigations, they call it the mud rock revolution. We need to have a revolution in our way of thinking about mud rocks because there's that old, calm, and placid sea idea, and mud rocks look like this and the mud, uh, the the flume experiments show that mud rocks, like in Grand Canyon, can form rapidly, and you can see some of the uh, uh, ripple cross lamination in the mud rocks, and uh, and and here uh, here here are some of the uh, the experiments, and it argues very well against uh, the calm and placid sea. So when I'm teaching to the graduate students at Cedarville University, I'm a revolutionary. I'm leading a revolution in our way of thinking about uh, mud rocks. And those fine grain uh, uh, clay and silt deposits, uh, they, they form rapidly by clumping of particles. They didn't fall vertically. They fall at, fell, fall at 15 degree angle. And they form in fast moving currents. Just the opposite of what everybody has been assuming for about 200 years. And uh, so it's called the mud rock revolution. And uh, at Grand Canyon, you can interpret the mud rocks and, and those, the shale layers in completely differently than the way they've been interpreted over uh, the history. And so we need the history of geology. And so we, we need a completely different view of the, 
a, and a revolution from the tired and stagnant way of thinking. And uh, so I'm, rev I'm leading a revolution. And I, I give uh, my students a zag tube, which is an object with uh, all that glitter, you know, that falls through the uh, water. And uh, if you turn it vertical, you can watch the particles separate and, and settle slowly. But if you turn the zag tube at a 45 degree angle, the particles clump together and slide down the tube. So I hold up the zag tube and say, I'm leading this revolution in, uh, in our way of thinking. And geologists need to think in this uh, different domain and understand uh, how the, the uniformitarian dogma of the 19th century has impacted the present thinking. And so we need a different way of thinking. Now, there is a geologist uh, who said, Steve, you've done a wonderful job at explaining how granular and particulate material can settle rapidly and form uh, layers. But he was saying, um, uh, Dave Sturm, uh, the petroleum geologist in Bakersfield, California, he said, don't you ever think about explaining the limestone layers of Grand Canyon by rapid and catastrophic process because there in the limestone layers of Grand Canyon is proof positive of millions of years of slow and gradual buildup of particles. And so, uh, boy, I took that on and I'm, uh, 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 I'm interested in limestone uh, now to, under, uh, and I want to explain how limestones form. And uh, so this one limestone layer called the Redwall Limestone in the Grand Canyon has fascinated me now for th over 30 years. I've been looking at it. And there's one two meter thick part of the Redwall Limestone. You see it right there in the image. This two meters of thickness, the, that limestone, I've spent, um, well, now 20 years, 25 years studying that one layer. And uh, I've come away believing that limestone can form rapidly by uh, extreme uh, catastrophic process. And the, the layer you're looking at, uh, I call it the Whitmore nautiloid bed. And that two meters thickness is fascinating me. And so uh, I've been studying it all over the Grand Canyon. What's most interesting to me about it is the middle of it, right in the middle, it seemed to have the coarsest fossils. The coarse debris is in the middle, the fine uh, is at the top and the bottom. How did the coarse fossil material get in the middle of that layer? And uh, that's part of what I've been interested in. And the most important fossil in that layer, and boy, there's lots of fossils in limestone, but in that limestone layer, the most important fossil is called a nautiloid, nautiloid, and it's a squid in a shell. It's a, uh, an extinct marine creature resembling a squid, had, which had a solid chambered shell. And the, the squid-like organism lived in that shell, the fast-swimming creature. And uh, in that layer, there's about one nautiloid per square meter through the whole Grand Canyon. And I've, uh, I've uh, visited so many different locations that it's fascinating me. Look at the, uh, what they look like in cross-section. We're looking down on a bedding surface, and you're seeing the, uh, the long, straight nautiloid there's the open end where the body of the squid is, and then here's the chambers of the shell, and it narrows to a point. And there's a long tube that goes down through the, uh, the shell called the siphuncle, and there you see a meter long uh, uh, fossil nautiloid. They're all through the uh, rock. There you see another spear-like uh, nautiloid. Nautiloids are especially abundant in that one layer. And um, I talked to the North American nautiloid expert, 
And uh, I said, I've been finding these nautiloids down the length of the Grand Canyon in this one layer in Redwall Limestone. And he, he says, how many nautiloids have you seen? Well, I, I've counted thousands of them. I'm drawing pictures of thousand nautiloids. And uh, he says, you've seen more large nautiloids than I have. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm finding only one type, <laughs> the big type of nautiloid in the Grand Canyon. About one out of seven of the nautiloids in that layer, they're standing vertically. Interesting. Tip end down, the pointy end down. And so uh, it's interesting. I can use the nautiloids to estimate the current direction and the speed of deposition. And the, the nautiloids that are pointing down in the bed argue for rapid capture of the fossils as they're buried through the, in, the, in this layer. This map sh shows the entire Grand Canyon from upstream at what's called Lee's Ferry. The Grand Canyon extends 500 kilometers down into Nevada right here at Lake Mead near Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, that's where I've been studying the nautiloids in that limestone layer. That limestone layer is a very prominent right here at what's called Nautiloid Canyon. That's where I first saw the nautiloids. Then I started finding them through the Eastern Grand Canyon, then into the Central Grand Canyon, especially Toro Weep area, and then in the western Grand Canyon at the Wallapai uh, Reservation and the Shevitz Plateau, Wallapai Plateau, Mugion Rim area. And then I found them out in the Muddy Mountains in Nevada, out here. And uh, then I went over to Las Vegas, Nevada, in the city limits of Las Vegas, Nevada with the stratosphere hotel in las vegas eye level on frenchman mountain i found nautiloids okay nautiloids over an enormous distance and about one nautiloid per square meter so how many nautiloids are out there a billion maybe you know there could be fossils all over the place and so that's uh, that shows me something about the the, the layers or the beds I think mud flow is the process that buried nautiloids in that one layer. Here's a, the, a, a mud flow layer uh, that's forming at Mount St. Helens. You can see what that's like. Uh, high speed mud flows at Mount Pinatubo in the Philippine Islands, they, they form. And as these flows move, they have a lot of sediment and they uh, quickly uh, deposit beds and from the slurry, from the mud slurry. You can see lots of, uh, uh, of mud moving down uh, the river channels. Here's what I imagine. I imagine there's a different type of mud flow that buried the nautiloids. Imagine an underwater, underwater mud flow sweeping along the floor of the ocean, the, uh, sweeping up the, the fast-moving predator, the, the nautiloid, sweeping it into this, vacuuming it into the slurry, and then the slurry abruptly uh, uh, freezing and trapping the nautiloids. That's my explanation. And imagine this, a, 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 a mud flow coming out of Colorado, moving to the southwest over northern Arizona into Nevada, even into California, uh, 25 cubic kilometers of mud sliding along the ocean floor at five kilometers per second, something like that. It's, uh, that's the explanation that I favor, a, a rapidly moving mud slurry. In other words, the limestone layers formed in what? Minutes, not millions of years. Okay, here I am uh, talking to you about limestone layers forming minutes, not millions of years. 
Is it common placid seas that deposited limestone? There's other limestone layers in there that need to, need to be carefully studied. The ones that we studied look like they formed rapidly. M minutes, not millions of years. Presented some of this at Geological Society of America meeting. Okay, and then um, modern observations in fl flume experiments have revolutionized sedimentation thinking with the understanding that strata deposition was a very catastrophic process. Modern observations, the mud flows especially, and the flume experiments have revolutionized sedimentation thinking with the understanding of strata deposition is a very catastrophic process. Are, are you going to join the revolution in uh, the way of thinking that I want to get going in, uh, in geology? Let's revolutionize our, our way of thinking about uh, sedim the process of sedimentation. Amen. Okay, now, so let's, let's move on from sedimentation. Let's talk about tectonics, the process of tectonics. Antonio Snyder, who spoke German... Okay, Antonio Snyder in 1859 had moved to Ohio in the United States of America and he was thinking about uh, the continental distribution and uh, Antonio Snyder postulated that the continents were once assembled together as you see in the left illustration, he proposed that North America is up against Europe, Europe up against Africa, South America up against Africa, and he proposed the configuration of continents that later became known as Pangaea. And he uh, proposed this in 1859. He could not find a German or English or um, English publisher, so he published in Paris, France. Okay, he published it in French. It's the book is called La Creation Essays Mysteries de Volier. I've I've I know more French than I know German, <laughs> but uh, the creation and its mysteries revealed. He published the book, 1859. Um, proposing the supercontinent that broke apart. And he proposed that the catastrophic plate tectonics occurred, the, the, uh, the continents split apart, forming in the Atlantic Ocean Basin, if you will, and he proposed that it occurred during a global flood. Interesting book, isn't it? Have you heard about the book? No, you, have, you don't hear about it. 1859 was a bad year to publish the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics leading to a global flood. What else happened in the year 1859? Charles Darwin published the book Origin of Species. Okay, and so people were looking for a different explanation for tectonics. They weren't looking... Uh, for a catastrophic flood view. So what happened to Antonio Snyder's book? It went on the shelf to gather dust. It gathered dust until uh, Alfred Wegener, a German meteorologist who was working a lot in uh, Greenland, he, uh, he blew the dust off of Antonio Snyder's book. And what did Alfred Wegener do? He believed that plate tectonics occurred slowly, like the rate at which your fingernail grows. And he sketched the idea, which we later called continental drift. Continental drift. And so the theory of continental drift and Alfred Wegener, German uh, meteorologist, uh, was proposed in uh, what? Um, about 1925, uh, Wagner is proposing continental drift. What happened to that? That was roundly ignored and vilified by the, the geologists of the day because um, 
there was, there was thinking of stationary continents at the time. And so uh, there were rebuttal lectures given to, uh, to Alfred Wegener's idea of continental drift. And uh, then what happened in the 1960s when I was going to uh, undergraduate school in geology, that's when the revolution occurred in tectonics. I've been involved in revolutionary thinking a lot, haven't I? Okay, I remember my professors telling me the continents haven't budged an inch. Forget about Alfred Wegener's idea of continental drift. The, the, the continents are absolutely stationary. They're locked uh, on the mantle of the earth underneath. They aren't moving at all. And uh, then I remember the professors just a few late years later as I was graduating saying, well, there's something to that idea about the continents moving. And, uh, and there, there was a revolution in thinking about continental drift, that whole th thinking. So there's uh, the, the supercontinent according to Antonio S Snyder. I believe that we should go back to the Antonio Snyder way of thinking of catastrophic plate tectonics, not slow and gradual plate tectonics or continental drift. And, um, I'm, and, and I, I like that revolutionary way of thinking. So take a look at the earth. If you, if you take a, the globe of the earth and you put a, a line around the earth, like I've suggested in this uh, image, you can see the tectonics of Western North America, the Cordilleran uh, tectonic belt going up into Alaska around the corner. And what's on the other side? Siberia. Yeah, okay, there's Siberia, the Himalayas, and then the Alps. <laughs> that whole thing, that belt, that, that equator in that repositioned earth goes all around. And so you have the tectonic belt, the circum Pacific and uh, the Alpine Himalayan uh, uh, tectonic belt. And uh, so uh, it looks like movement of continents and ocean floor has been shoved underneath continents. And I'm a believer in catastrophic plate tectonics. That's the revolution I wanna lead uh, and that way of thinking. And if catastrophic plate tectonics occurred, it can occur during a global flood. And so the tectonic models suggest that Pacific Ocean floor has been shoved under Western North America. Take a look at Southern Alaska. The Pacific Ocean floor has been shoved directly underneath a uh, head-on collision with Southern Alaska. And you can see where the rock layers have been bent up forming the, uh, um, uh, this belt over the steep border fault and, and off to the south uh, is uh, where the ocean floor has been shoved under. And you can see the Nikolai Greenstone, which are volcanic ocean floor rocks, look like they've been shoved underneath the limestone and shale layers of uh, uh, western Alaska. Grand Canyon also appears to be attached to the North American continent. And over in California, off to the west, the ocean floor has been shoved underneath western North America. Because of that light rock and, and sediment that's been shoved underneath western North America, the whole Colorado Plateau area, about a million square kilometer area, is uplifted on the average uh, almost two kilometers above sea level. Okay, you see this enormous plateau, the high plateau, and that's what makes the tectonic plateau of uh, the um, Colorado Plateau and, and allows the Colorado River and Grand Canyon to position, be positioned through that plateau. So strong tectonics of the past preceded the weak tectonics of the present. So we see earthquakes going on occasionally uh, in uh, areas uh, around uh, tectonic belts especially, but the strong tectonics that shoved the, the uh, western 
Pacific Plate underneath uh, Western North America, that whole thing is largely stopped and there's only weak tectonics going on today. So if tectonics is occurring today, it's occurring at the rate at which your fingernails growing, you know, something very slow. But that's not the, the, the tectonics of the past. Okay, uh, let's talk now about erosion. Now, tectonics has uplifted these plateaus and formed this elevated surface, and it is eroded. Okay, what the most remarkable thing about the Colorado Plateau and the five-state area and that million square kilometer area is it looks like the upper surface has been eroded away in a sheet fashion. The sheet fashion, I believe, is the retreat of the waters off the earth. The last appearance of the ocean was right there as the water was retreating off that surface and it beveled that surface widespread area. Then parts of the surface were uplifted more, like for example, the Kaibab upwarp here in eastern Grand Canyon and that was uplifted more and, uh, and created the, uh, the uh, topographic barrier where allowing a lake to form on the east side of the Kaibab upwarp. And uh, wow, there, there could be water there and it could break through and form Grand Canyon. And that's the theory that I've favored over the years. The spillover explanation for drainage, first sheet drainage, and then blockage and spillover. So you can imagine here, we're looking uh, obliquely over the Grand Canyon. With Google Earth, you can see the Eastern Grand Canyon, the ele elevated plateau. And here's the lake basin on the Eastern side of Grand Canyon. You're looking westward, you can see the entire Grand Canyon going down through there off toward uh, Nevada. And that uh, five, 500 kilometer long uh, Grand Canyon. And uh, wow, um, interesting, isn't it? And look at the, the barrier that's in the path. How did the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon get positioned through an upwarp plateau? In fact, an upwarp plateau right here, then there's a basin, then there's another upwarp plateau, then there appears to be a basin, another upwarp, and another basin. There's a series of basins and upwarps, and how did the Colorado River and Grand Canyon get positioned through those? Could it be spillover? And that's the explanation I'm, I've been working with. My explanation for Grand Canyon is that uh, Hopi Lake, a large lake at about uh, 6,100 feet elevation, which uh, works out to uh, what? About uh, um, 20, uh, 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 2,000 meters uh, elevation. That lake drained over the Kaibab Upwarp, this area in Eastern Grand Canyon, into the next basin below, which I call Toro Weep Basin, uh, Cataract, uh, uh, Syncline, uh, and this whole area in the central Grand Canyon was a temporary lake that spilled over the Eurinkerit uh, Plateau and the Shevitz Plateau along the Toro Weep Fault, and it spilled into the next basin below and into other basins. And so a series of spillover events could be the explanation. And if the lakes are draining, they could drain catastrophically. There's no modern example of a natural tectonic dam that fails slowly. Do you know of any? No, when a, when a lake and a dam fail, they fail rapidly. And so the, 
the spillover of the Colorado Plateau from in these from these basins can form the canyon rapidly. And of course, we have modern example at Mount St. Helens. Remember, I was talking about that yesterday. The mud flow on March 19, 1982, came down out of the crater and it eroded that uneven terrain to the west and it made a miniature Grand Canyon. Eroded uh, basalt layers deeply. And then here's a miniature Grand Canyon that was formed rapidly on March 19, 1982 by mud spilling through and catastrophic water flow making canyons rapidly. And that's uh, a good example of how things change. So there's Mount St. Helens, uh, the, the spillway at Mount St. Helens. It's about 180 feet, about 80 meters deep there. And then here's this other one here. Here's uh, two kilometers deep, uh, 25 to 40 times the scale at Grand Canyon. And uh, so um, catastrophic flow overtopping barrier eroding Grand Canyon. New way of thinking about Grand Canyon. So I'm leading a revolution in spillover erosion of Grand Canyon. Are spilling lakes all it takes? That's my, that's my crusade that I'm on, now my spillover crusade. Are spilling lakes all it takes? And there's a lot of geologists around who are starting to think that way, and I, which is cool. You know, lots of geologists are, are junking the idea the Colorado River cut Grand Canyon over tens of millions of years. And so I'm, uh, they're, they're joining my crusade. And so I'm, I'm glad to, to be uh, one of the, I'm not the only leader in this revolution. There's other things. So erosion, widespread beveling and spillover erosion of the past precede the channelized erosion of the present. So there's Grand Canyon. You see the the uh, upwarp surf uh, up surface, and there, there's the beveling of the plateau, and then there's the channelized erosion from the spillover of lakes. That's the way I look at Grand Canyon erosion. And uh, notice on the rim of Grand Canyon, you have volcanoes. Those volcanoes spilled lava over the rim into the Grand Canyon. The lava flows even flowed down to the river level and temporarily blocked uh, the flow along the river. So sedimentation, tectonics, erosion, and then volcanoes. And so you see the volcanoes, the volcanoes especially on the rim of Grand Canyon. And there are volcanic ash strata layers underneath those volcanoes, but uh, the volcanoes are kind of calming down, and so you can see this. And so yesterday, I talked to you about Yellowstone. Yellowstone, the enormous caldera, what? It's about 45 kilometers long, that elliptical depression. The, the whole volcano, when, when Yellowstone volcano exploded, it exploded violently and, and uh, distributed more than 2,000 times the explosion products at Mount St. Helens in some type of vertical and uh, general uh, um, flows and uh, the volcano collapsed into a giant hole that formed. And so you have the, the Yellowstone caldera, the Yellowstone caldera. And so volcanoes come after sedimentation, erosion, tectonics, Te sedimentation, tectonics, erosion. Now, if you look in uh, the, some of the dino deposits especially, you'll find something very interesting. A lot of the dino deposits have volcanic ash and volcanic fragments all around the dino bones. And the dinosaurs were buried rather typically late in the flood layers, I believe, and all the volcanics around. So there's giant amounts of volcanic layers like in the Dinosaur National Monument in uh, Utah and Colorado, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ash deposits, and then you can see the articulated skeletons of dinosaur. Here's, a, here's the uh, vertebrae of, a, of a, 
uh, apatosaurus, and you can see clavicle bones, le uh, femur bones, uh, that kind of thing. It's a jumble of deposits, and it looks like dinos were, were, were caught up in a slurry flow and were rapidly buried. Again, uh, rapid burial. And uh, so uh, dino deposits. And the dino deposits that, uh, are very widespread. The Morrison Formation, the main dinosaur-bearing formation in western North, North America, where, where we know uh, 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 some of the big dinos, and the, the formations above the uh, Hell Creek Formation and the Lance Formation above the Morrison Formation, where a lot of the T-Rex skeletons uh, and fossils come from, that is part of the, these widespread volcanic ash deposits. Well, the Cory Sandstone at Dinosaur National Monument is in the Brushy Basin member and with all the volcanic, deposit, uh, volcanic fragments in the middle of the Morrison Formation. And uh, look how widespread it is. Uh, it goes from Canada down to the, near the Mexican border, the, the Arizona-Mexican border here. So it's huge. It's a million squ square kilometer area of uh, volcanic ash and material. And the dinos are there at the dinosaur quarry. Mount St. Helens provides what? All kinds of evidence of a, a volcanic process. But you know the volcano that made Mount St. Helens, the vol a recent eruption, only made what? Uh, just a couple cubic kilometers of volcanic ash came out of that recent eruption. Yet the, uh, uh, the Morrison Formation had more than 4,000 cubic kilometers of material in that one layer. And uh, so volcanoes of the past greatly exceeded volcanoes of the present in volume. And so you get the idea of declining power of volcanoes with time. Volcanoes illustrate the declining power of eruption with time. We look at modern volcanoes, and they're small. Thank God they're small. And, uh, but imagine those volcanoes that were uh, with the dinos, uh, all that going on. That, that is, uh, those are colossal volcanoes. And colossal flood deposition burying dino skeletons. Okay, the power of geologic process uh, has declined with time. And if you think about the creation flood model, during creation week, especially the first three days, there was a lot of tectonic and sedimentary process likely going on. And then uh, by the end of day three, plants were established on stable continents and things were, were stable and until the time of the global flood. And then what happened? All the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and a global flood was upon the earth during the days of Noah. And then what happened? The process declined exponentially with time. So the process declined exponentially with time. And there you see the, uh, the, the decline. Now when Noah got out of the ark, uh, there was a rainbow, birds were chirping, God made a promise to Noah never again to flood the earth. But the, the tectonic process were still slowing down. There was volcanoes still going off. All kinds of things were happening. And so the, uh, the, the, the process of sedimentation, tectonics, erosion, volcanoes declined exponentially into the present that we're seeing right here. So the declining power with time, power of geologic process years after flood. Or what I like to think, I bought a, a new vehicle, and what is the value of the new vehicle? It's exponential decline with time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the... Uh, that's a way to think about uh, geologic process. And so, thank God we don't have volcanoes going off in the, uh, in the present like we had in the past. Thank God we don't have ocean flood sedimentation over 
plateaus, even high plateaus like present. So, in the last days, mockers will come saying, all things continue as they were from the beginning. The second uh, letter of Peter, chapter 3, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's what Peter said about the latter-day scoffers. And that's what we see in geology a lot. Geologists have been saying all things continue from the beginning, slowly, in other words. They are willing to ignore this, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. Second Peter chapter 3 shows that biblical flood model for thinking about creation and the global flood, not thinking about evolution and a calm and placid earth over millions of years. The last words of Apostle Peter uh, at the end of the chapter, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall into your fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Peter is warning about the latter-day scoffers, be on your guard, don't uh, 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 fall into the error of the unprincipled men who what? Deny creation in the global flood, uh, and, uh, but grow in grace and knowledge. That's the last words of, of Peter to the church. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, last words of Peter to the church are pretty uh, direct. The exponential decline, geologic process were greatly accelerated in the past and now have slowed significantly, telling a general story of exponential decline. And so the exponential decline story, not the, the uniformitarian dogma, is where we should be going. And it's consistent with the Apostle Peter's Statement. Okay, so I got a, a couple minutes here, so let's finish up. The five pieces for understanding Grand Canyon. You can assemble the pieces and get a view of uh, how the earth formed. And it's not just Grand Canyon, it's the earth everywhere. If you think about uh, the, the pieces of this puzzle that come together, sedimentation, tectonics, Erosion, volcanoes, exponential decline. The five pieces for understanding the history of the earth, essentially, especially Grand Canyon, and uh, the global flood elsewhere, like here. The waters were upon the face of the whole earth, Genesis 8, verse 9. Gen Genesis 9, verse 11, it's a, almost a Hebrew superlative, all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. You can't say it more emphatically in a short Hebrew statement that the, the flood was global, that it covered everything. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And then Peter says, the world that then was being deluged with water perished. Grand Canyon tells a marvelous story of creation in the global flood. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm going to...